<laughs> yeah, where in the Bible is the multiverse? Show me the verse yeah. in Isaiah that talks about the multiverse. The yes. Theism is not giving you the tools you need to explain reality. Yeah, the whole concept of gods, more and more gods. Like, are gods just splitting up the universe? Are we, like, cutting the universe into ever smaller chunks? It's like, you're the god of this sector, and you're the god of this sector, because we've only got one universe, so... God's right. territory is always shrinking. That doesn't right. make it's any the sense. Mob. It's the new it's New York in like the twenties. And the the um yeah. oh man, I just forgot the name of the family and the godfather, but you know, this family has control right now, so we gotta what if it's like you zoom out and it's like Muslims have like twenty percent of the universe and their their mob boss is like constantly negotiating <laughs> with Christianity's mob boss for like, no yeah. man, you get from the Milky uh, Way south. That's the way it works over here. <laughs> exactly. That would be very, hilarious. very dumb point. The theist, uh, they actually got it right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, this is it gets wilder and wilder the more we the more we pick it apart. Argument from design, it's just God of the gaps, right? Yes, yes. The history of this Sorry. argument is so poor. It's like back in the time of Moses, right? Mm -hmm. Moses is like, huh, we have a culture. Uh, thou shalt not kill is our culture. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not covet. This is our culture. And guess what? Our culture is designed by God. Like even Jordan yeah. Peterson doesn't buy this argument. Jordan Peterson is like, yeah, this culture, they already had these values. They just instantiated their values in religion. Like this right. whole, like even like every time design is invoked, there's actually evolution behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I put out a video about this not too long ago. Vampire bats have a way of, of making everybody honest, you know, like Real. animals. Really? Yeah. So Robert Sapolsky, I'll, I'll tell this story very quickly. Um, so vampire bats, they have this kind of mutual agreement amongst everybody in the, I don't know what they're called, a flock, <laughs> a flock, a pack, a troop, I don't know. In a group of bats, the, all of the moms will take turns feeding all of the kids. And the way they'll do that is they'll fly over to something, they'll suck its blood, and they'll fly back with its neck engorged, and they will feed all of the, all of the children. Well, so a group of very, very crafty Stanford students decided to see what would happen if one of these mothers lied. So what they did mm. is as she was out looking for blood, they trapped her, they filled her sack up with air, and they sent her back. So she feels like she is full of blood, and so she goes back, but she isn't, obviously. So she can't feed anyone, not even her own kids. Mm. She can't feed anyone. Right. So she doesn't feed any of them. Well, what starts to happen afterwards as the new the other mothers are going out they will not feed that mother's children because she turned right. on them she betrayed them right if this is this is something that i would like is so is this evidence of a giant bat god or is this evidence <laughs> of evolution <laughs> uh, evolution creating reciprocal behavior is this yeah. evidence of evolution going, taking its hand out of the cloud and saying, don't kill people, don't steal from people. It is bad for your whole tribe when you do that. Yeah. It, the, yeah. The design argument, it's, it's so silly because th they're acting like, oh, these bats, they have free will and they're freely to, it's like, it's a, yeah. it's a mathematical strategy. If you're getting yes. deprived, you're going to tit for tat. It's, they evolved yep. these strategies. Is It yep. doesn't make sense to have someone micromanaging bat strategies from design. Yes. Yes, yes. Oh man. Okay, so um what 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 am I seeing on the bottom here? What are the lower arrows? Yeah, I think there is a lag here. So sorry if it feels like I'm cutting you off a lot. I think that uh we're just yeah, kind no, of it's fine. crashing our Wi-Fi. My Wi-Fi is really bad. I I need to like upgrade my Wi-Fi because it's horrible. <laughs> Um, it's, yeah, so, it's all good. so basically, basically the, what I'm showing here is that theism has a history of design arguments and like natural scientific epistemologies have a history of debunking these arguments with evolution. So culture, 
evolution of culture. Language, evolution of language. What does the Bible say about language? Like, it was magically created at the Tower of Babel. Like, God is sprinkling language dust on all yeah. of these cultures <laughs> and making all of these... He's He's intelligently designing all these languages. That's just mm -hmm. absurd. Like, we can see the history of linguistic evolution. It's like, there's mutations in language. We can track the etymological history of mutations in language to their origin. It's absurd to say language was designed. But, okay, that's debunked. Culture designed, debunked. Language designed, debunked. Humans, biology, debunked. We have, like, theists, they'll argue with this one because they have to. But we can trace our origin in our DNA. We know that we are cousins with, you know, chimpanzees and bonobos. Mm -hmm. You can see the evolutionary heritage because your ancestry is in your DNA. We've got the evidence of macro evolution. This is a dead argument that it's, it's, these theists, they're just doomed to being debunked on this point as well. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. Uh, it's it's almost a, it's sad to see it laid out like this. But okay, so we have at, at the beginning. <laughs> I love this meme. At the beginning of the top one, if you're not watching it, it's that like guy who doesn't understand <laughs> things meme. <laughs> He's like, wait, what comes before the designer? <laughs> and what we have at the beginning of the other one is uh, necessity and randomness. So a point that you made in the debate, which you said it perfectly. I'll see if I can spit it back to you and to the audience in a coherent way. But it's not. It's not just that we have chance or we have design. We have this thing called evolution. And evolution is not a design and it's not a chance. It is its own thing. And basically what evolution is, is here's 20 different mutations. Let's see what sticks. And that that is random. I will give you that. Those mutations, very random. But then they have to go through this filter of good and not good. And by good, the crux of the good, not good filter is, does it help you survive and pass on those mutations or does it not? So if you, so now we have randomness through a filter of longevity, essentially. And that Jacob wants to call it a, a, just a part of design, but then that could be where the buck stops. That right there could be where the buck stops. It could be the end of the argument. It says, look, we have all these mutations. They spring forth randomly. They get filtered by if you if they work, then you pass them on. If they don't work, then you die and nobody gets those. That's the end. It's where the buck stops. Instead, if you say that it's designed, now you have to answer another more difficult question that nobody can answer. And that is, okay, who designed it? And what they love to throw in, why did they design it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the whole designer, it's its not it, its not a sufficient cause. It's not like they're just invoking a magical cause. That's not right. a rigorous explanation. It's not a scientific explanation. It doesn't have its own suite of predictions that it satisfies. It doesn't work. And it's not parsimonious. So. But the, yeah. what I'm trying to highlight here is that there is a pattern. Theism, <laughs> the, the deeper we dig, the more we debunk theistic arguments. And they they keep moving the goalpost, and the pattern is theistic arguments are doomed. Like, just wait your turn. You're next. We're not going to couple off here and there. Okay, next is we're getting more evidence. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, I have two thoughts on some deeper layers here, if you want to go really deep here. Because we didn't have time to go it. super deep. Jacob, he was trying to go super deep, but it's impossible to do in four-minute rebuttal. You know, you right. can't go super deep. So there's a concept of, like, chemical evolution right? Abiogenesis gives you chemical evolution. Like the argument is, how did the first bacteria evolve, right? So there's okay. a concept of chemical evolution where some chemicals, they bond together and then the chemicals will reproduce. And if the chemicals are reproducing, guess what? You've got evolution of chemicals. And so that's mm -hmm. what gives you a bacteria. When the chemicals are reproducing, those chemicals, they want protection and so they get a little bubble, a little wall around them. You've got a bacteria. So chemical evolution gives you your first life. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're, the theists, they like to argue it's impossible, but there's no good reason to say it's impossible. We have lots of evidence for chemical evolution. That is, so now you're at a part, either you didn't cover this in the debate or it's later on. Did, did Jacob have something to say to this or was... 
what do you think a theist no, would say I, to I didn't this? Have just time that it's to impossible? Discuss, yeah, they just assert it's impossible, even though we have evidence that every step of abiogenesis is self-replicating, self-assembling, like RNA, it builds itself. RNA, mm -hmm. it knows how to gather proteins. RNA, it knows how to build proteins. And RNA self-assembles, like, all of these things, they're already there in the magic soup of life. Like, if you have atoms, then you have chemical evolution. Bada bing, bada boom. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah. But who taught him how to do that? Aha! Ah! <laughs> oh, man. Such a bad, such a bad rebuttal. Um, oh, man. But, but we can go deeper. Yeah, do it. You, you lose me more and more only because I'm okay. not at your level, but it does make sense when you say it. So like, and it'll be beneficial for people who are smarter than me. So please yeah. uh, continue to, to go in the direction that you want to go. But you, every time I talk to you, you lose me at like 95% of the way through our, our chat. I'm like, all right, you're officially, <laughs> oh, you're officially too must... smart for me, but I enjoy hearing you oh, explain that, that, these things. So that's a problem on my part. I should be able to explain it more simply. I'll try to do a better job. <laughs> no, I understood um, the last thing. So what's, what's the next thing? Okay. So behind chemical evolution would be particle evolution, right? So we keep okay. going down. This is the evolution all the way down argument. And what I want to say is we have evidence for particle evolution. So like okay. there is a pattern of it going all the way down. This is a rational conclusion, right? Particles right. at the Big Bang, guess what happened? The Big Bang, it didn't just produce matter. The Big Bang produced matter and antimatter. Oh my goodness, what is antimatter? Antimatter is the opposite of matter and they destroy each other on contact, right? And so okay. put yourself in the position of like a star, right? Pretend that stars are conscious. Cody is the divine star. He is, know it. He is the center of the solar system. <laughs> That's actually <laughs> and true. And now Cody, he looks at this universe. <laughs> you're looking at the universe and you're like, huh, the universe the universe looks finely tuned for me. I'm a special star and everything is designed for me. Yay. Well, right. that's not. That's wrong. Because you are made of matter. And half of the Big Bang was antimatter. The only uh -huh. reason you exist was because there was a mathematical imbalance between matter and antimatter. For every one billion pieces of matter, there was minus one antimatter. And so the Big Bang is... Mm -hmm generating 1 million pieces of matter and 999 million pieces of antimatter. They blow each other up and then there's one piece of matter that flies off into the distance. And then you repeat this process and you're evolving. Every time you repeat, destroy one piece of matter, destroy okay. one piece of matter, destroy one piece of matter. And then you aggregate all of those tiny pieces of matter and now you've got a star. Well, it was not finely tuned for the star. It just, it evolved from this particle evolution. Right. It's almost a spandrel. That wasn't even really what was going on. It's just like it happened over here while the real show was going on over here. See, I understood that. So this is really, this, this, um, this format of just kind of a free flow format. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to go deep because yes. I, I couldn't do any of this in the debate. It was too constrained. Yeah. But I can go even deeper than particle evolution, right? Okay. We can go okay. deeper. Jacob kept wanting to go to the root of reality. Well, let, let's do it, Jacob. Watch this video. Let's rehash it out because you don't need a divine mind at the base of reality, right? So there, there's an argument that behind physics is math. And so we can go deeper than this particle evolution and we can do a mathematical evolution, right? So... Mm -hmm. The hypothesis could be that at the very beginning, there was nothing. Okay, let's just grant your premise. The beginning, there's nothing. Well, mathematically, what does nothing look like? What is the number that represents nothing? It's a, it's a zero. Yeah, okay. So let's play with the algebra. Zero equals zero. Okay. <laughs> That, what, what, how do we, let's do a mathematical conservation of energy. We've got zero. Okay. 
We're going to conserve this zero. We're going to split the zero in half. What happens when you split a zero in half? You've got plus one and negative one. So zero is mathematically equal to plus one and negative one. Now you've got mm -hmm. the creation of something while mathematically conserving nothing. And so this is an argument from necessity, right? This is mathematical necessity. You cannot violate the mathematics. Zero is not being violated, so you necessarily have plus one and right. minus one. And so, and then you can play I'm with randomness. because you're making me think that I'm high right now, but this makes perfect sense. <laughs> this makes perfect sense. Yeah. You don't need a divine mind to say, oh, here's your plus one, go make a universe with the plus one. You just need right. mathematical necessity to give your plus one, go make a universe with that math. Right? And you oh, just man. iterate. Iterate. Zero, plus right. one, minus one. Iterate. Zero, right. plus one. Iterate. Iterate, iterate, random, random, boom, you have something. That That is, I, yeah, I would love to see. If, if we could somehow, I don't know how I can like insert myself into this third conversation or this next conversation. But <laughs> if we could have like a, a part two where it's just you, me and Jacob, maybe Hayden could be there and we, we round it out with some nice round numbers, but, um, yeah. and not a formal debate. Cause I am the worst formal debater. You do not want me on your side making formal debates, but I, I think bringing this thing full circle, well, dude, you did difficult. amazing. I could see your nerves. I'm going to be mm -hmm. honest. Thank I could you. see how, like, I could see the anticipation. It, in the beginning of the video, I'm like, somebody put a comment in the, in the, the video that just said like, Seth looks like he's a re like a boxer getting ready for a match or something. And that's a perfect way to say it. And I would say that you like, yeah, yeah. you, you got your punches in and you hit hard. And I don't think that Jacob ever recovered. <laughs> um, I think it was a, a fantastic yeah. showing. <laughs> if I could vote for anyone who agrees with my way of thinking to make that case, it would be you and you you performed better than i thought you would thank you for that that's generous yeah i i was i was actually having a bad day i was having a lot of headaches and a lot of brain fog mm -hmm. and so i probably took a little too much caffeine to try to mitigate my <laughs> symptoms and so i was like i was a little bit extra jittery and mm -hmm. so but look at I, you with I your materialistic explanation and, for the jitters I know, I know. What can Just I say? Just doing it all the way through. But yeah, Jacob, he didn't have any reputation for my arguments. He was on defense the whole time. The whole yeah. time I was, like, his whole fine-tuning, it was not justified. And I was just exposing how there's so many explanations. There's so much justification that you're missing. And he, yeah, it was, he didn't, he didn't even have time to, like, prove that his epistemology was worth anything. Yes, yes, I agree. Um... Yeah, I'd love to see part two. I'd love to. I'd love for part two to be more of like a, a fun conversation. Um, and yeah. if there's any way I can moderate or facilitate that, then you both have my number. Let's do it. All right. Uh, th this slide, we basically already covered everything. It's just basically showing that Jacob, he just asserts a lot of stuff. He doesn't know that the universe is finely tuned. Like, he just asserts that the universe is fi finely tuned. Like, right. he's appealing to some authority... Like, there's debate. There's a lot of debate about what that even means. How does it apply? Um, he asserts that, you know, things have to be random or designed. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, he asserts that mind is par parsimonious. That's not the case. Like, he just, like, he he, pr he pretends like evolution's a bad argument when it's not. And he somehow just, he asserts the multiverse is false because it seems weird. So, lots of bad arguments. He's just... Post hoc, fitting the evidence to his bias. Oh, if 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 some scientist says something that confirms my worldview, therefore my worldview is right. It's just backwards right. reasoning. What was interesting about that, I just to chime in a, a quick point here. Um, I noticed that theists do this where they want to cite a big scientist and then say like, well, you can't disagree with him. And where I think this comes from is this is this confusion of epistemologies where they see their leaders as people who can't be questioned and you must agree mm. with. And so they yes. assume yes. that people like us think the same way as them. And now here's the thing, mm. we don't. And yes. so I think I think whenever somebody says that or does that, I always wanna say, hey, Jacob, your theism is showing like, you're, it's, you're giving yeah. away <laughs> how you think by assuming that I think that way. So I just wanted to throw that out as a, as a point that I noticed because exactly. he did it multiple times in the debate. Oh. My family, they do that all the time. It's like, Seth, you're following the prophet of Sam Harris. It's like, no, yeah. 
that's not my epistemology. You know, yeah, I, I don't follow. I, I saw someone coin. There's a phrase, "Great man epistemologies." Right? There's a lot of <laughs> theists who want to debunk evolution, and the most common theistic method of debunking evolution is mm -hmm. they say, oh, Darwin is the prophet of evolution, and I'm going to yeah. debunk Darwin, and if Darwin yeah. is wrong, the whole thing collapses. And it's like, dude, right. scientific epistemologists went way over your head. That's not how it yeah. works. We do not Just because rely... that's how it works with the Book of Mormon doesn't mean that's how it works with biology. Exactly. Just because you can say, and look, it, it really is a case of like, um, it, it's just a case of them exposing exactly how they think about their worldview. So it's yeah. just like, and if you're if you're observant, it you'll catch it every time. It's hilarious. Well, the sad thing is, it shows their cognitive status. They haven't learned enough to move past that point. They're cognitively stuck in a primitive epistemology, and if they could just learn a more uh, more robust epistemology, like a collective network of evidentiary expertise, right? Mm -hmm. the, like a meta-analysis, multiple studies, we're mitigating biases. There's an American study with an American bias. We're going to get a Chinese study with a Chinese bias. We're going to aggregate all the biases together and all of the mm -hmm. contradicting biases minimize. And we get like this average picture of reality that doesn't mm -hmm. appeal to any expert or any authority. It's like they're, they're missing that whole system. Right. So um, to try to go through these real quick, um, someone made a good point. Uh, just I was reviewing some experts talking about fine-tuning. Someone made an interesting point. If you're going to claim that this universe is fine-tuned, you, you must have information from outside the universe to claim that. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You have, like, in order yeah. to say this is a rare universe, that's putting yourself outside the universe and saying, oh, look, right. there's a bunch of, like, rarity here and that goes back to jacob doesn't know that this is fine-tuned he's just that's so smart that's such a good point yeah and uh, just to reiterate there's logical mathematical evidence for the multiverse david albert sean carroll talk about how it's a very uh, very mathematically parsimonious framework um and there's a empirical evidence that i'm citing here george f stathio they've detected the dmap has detected signs of inflation and inflation is what you look for. So if multiverse, then we should expect to find inflation, right? They built the hypothesis, they created a prediction, then you go test for inflation, and then they found the inflation, so that confirms the hypothesis, right? And so, so what what does in this context, what do we mean by inflation? Yeah. I'm not I'm not very uh familiar with this. I, I'm not like a, that much of a sciencey guy. So yeah inflation what does yeah. it look like so i i'm not an expert so i'm not qualified to answer this either but my rudimentary understanding is that the universe is expanding right oh the universe okay. is expanding exponentially and i think that that principle is the inflation principle okay okay and uh if somebody's watching this and is curious then uh you have you have the guys who are talking about this so you can click on david albert or sean carroll and research more Anyway, back to you. Um, now, I also noticed someone else make a really good argument that I'm going to reiterate here in number in letter C. God should not require fine tuning because he has all power. Like, why does God like play with the dice? That was the whole Einstein Einstein critique. God does not play dice with the universe. If God wants a perfect universe. He should just snap his fingers and poof it into existence. Why does he mm -hmm. need to like micromanage all the dice? And so the fact point. that there's all these physical constants, all of these variables are evidence that you, the universe comes from variables. It doesn't come from God because God could just skip the variables and go straight to what he wants. Another, another very good point. And so proceeding to the next thing here, just to iterate the parsimony of the mathematics. Sean Carroll, he talks about how you could draw an analogy to like algebra and integers, right? You could build a theory of mathematics and the theory of mathematics is one plus one equals something bigger than one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you build that theory. And then if you iterate that theory, you come up with an infinite number of integers. You just keep adding one, you've right. got infinity. Well, according to Jacob Hansen, well, that's weird. I don't like infinities because like, 
is math absurd because you can just iterate and get infinity? Yeah, like yes. That, well, the same, <laughs> the same thing with the multiverse. It's mm -hmm. mathematically the same. Like, right. if you have one, then you can build more. Like, that's all there is to it. And you can right. have it in. Like, what stops an infinite integer? What stops infinite multiverses? Nothing. Right. What would, if it is design, if the choices are design, are design or random chance, why is one universe possible? And another one is not. That's basically the point that I hear you making. And it's very solid. Explain to me why there can't be two. There was yeah. one already. The building blocks are here. The process has been proven. Why aren't there mm -hmm. a million? Why isn't it exactly. one more every day? Yeah, very, very smart. So his appeal to the weirdness of infinity is not mathematically or logically sound. Right. right? Jacob, he can make an intuitive, like an appeal to human yeah. intuition, right? He can talk about dice. He can talk about yeah, pool yeah. tables. But what struck me from the debate, and I'm going to bring this up again, and you actually have it as as point uh, G, we are 18, it's one in 18 quadrillionth. That was the figure that you said. You gave him a figure. And he turned around and said, if I had a pool table full of dice, and as when I see an argument happening like that, it's over. And the person with figures wins. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, his his dice. The, the entire universe is a bunch of dice, and only yeah. a tiny, only a tiny corner of the universe looks like it's got special dice. Yes, that's not that's not a fine that's not good for fine tuning. Right. Okay, this Taoism argument. I'm gonna show off my Chinese a little bit. Are you ready? Dude, I'm. I just put my seatbelt on, so let's do this. <laughs> okay, so uh, to preface where I'm going with this, if we're gonna if we're gonna test theism, right? I think the best way to test theism is, is with predictions. Mm -hmm. Give me a prediction and let's go see if it matches reality. Okay. Yeah. So theism, Genesis is the prediction, right? In in the Bible, well, Christian theism, the Bible says, in the beginning there was a void, and then God speaks and there's light, and then God speaks, and then there's earth and water, and mm -hmm. then God speaks and there's plants, and yep. then God speaks, and then there's a sun. It's like, wait a second, why did the plants come before the sun? Right. Prediction fail! Yes. Like, this is the most epic prediction failure that I, I've never seen a good response to this. Uh huh. Other than Land? it's a metaphor, probably. Oh, yeah. And then you're just into la la uh, land. Oh, okay. So nothing matters and we can all just throw ourselves into a garbage can. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So theism, Christianity has like these predictions, they're pretty dang weak. Mm -hmm. So Christianity is like gone from this point. Yeah. And here's the thing. If, if uh, like Jacob, he likes to do this tiered argument structure where mm -hmm. he's like, well, you don't argue for Mormonism until you prove Christianity and mm -hmm. you don't argue for Christianity until you prove theism. Right. It's like, okay, like theist cosmology, like Christian theist cosmology, it's gone. So what about Taoist cosmology? Mm -hmm. Like it, if Taoist cosmology validates predictions are you going to join Taoism? you know what i mean yeah yeah and this is my point here is that Taoism, you can make an argument that is way better than genesis yeah so uh, what's your chinese here i want to okay. hear the chinese man you said chinese and now i'm just waiting for the chinese this is from the Tao Te Ching, which is Lao Tzu's scripture for Taoism. Mm -hmm. Tao Te Ching, i forget the chapter and verse but it goes like this Dao sheng yi, yi sheng er, er sheng san. Okay, so what that means is... I'm going to get that is, tattooed on my arm. Oh, it's beautiful. What <laughs> it's saying is the Tao, the Tao is like this, uh, you could describe the Tao as the flow of nature. You could describe the Tao as metaphysical principles. The Tao is okay. the root of reality. If you go all, okay. like turtles all the way down, the Tao is this mystery at the bottom. Okay. So like some people could say, if God is at the bottom, maybe God is the Tao, but God is like these metaphysical principles that give rise mm -hmm. to everything. So okay. what Taoism is saying is the Tao gave birth to one, like the number one. The Tao gave birth to the number one, and one gave birth to two, two gave birth to three, and three gave birth to everything. Right? No. Oh. So Taoism has got this this kind of vague metaphor or cosmology. And then it's up to us to interpret. Like, what does that mean? And so 
remember theism, like Jacob, he likes to like appropriate science and tie the science back into his <laughs> cosmology. So uh -huh. we're we're gonna play the same game that Jacob plays. We're gonna pretend that we're Dallas dogmatists. We're just gonna mm -hmm. post post hoc justify Dallasism. Okay. Uh, science has validated that energy is the root of all things, okay? So we've got energy. And uh, science has validated that we've got matter and antimatter. We've got this dichotomy, matter, mm -hmm. antimatter. And then science has validated that matter gives us protons, neutrons, and electrons. And with protons, neutrons, and electrons, we build everything. Yeah. So science has validated the prediction of Taoism. Nature... Right. Nature creates energy. That's the one. Mm -hmm. Energy creates matter, antimatter. That's the two. Mm -hmm. Matter, antimatter creates protons, electrons, and neutrons. And that gives us everything. Boom. Every Everyone has to convert to Taoism now. We've just validated Taoism. Yeah, Seth said. So we all have to do it now. And uh, the baptismal date is this Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the problem with theist interpretation, it's the postmodern thing. You can twist your story to like almost infinite numbers of interpretations. So you can always like squeeze the science backwards into your little hypothesis. But right. it's just very confirmation bias and it's it's very uh mental gymnastics sort of reasoning. Yes. All right. Um talk to me about Isaiah, because that was that was fun. Yeah. Um yeah, Isaiah I talked about in the debate. It's just it's just the interesting idea that Isaiah says that God created the earth to be inhabited. And he's like he's like getting all butthurt about it. God's like, I did not make the earth in vain. Like I didn't waste my time with the earth. I was very intentional to make the earth inhabited. And so he's like setting up this paradigm that one of the attributes of God is God doesn't waste his time creating planets. He does it specifically to give them life. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like, let's test right. that hypothesis. Go out and look. It's it's not doing so well. Yeah, let's see what percentage of planets. And then let's see if it takes God seven days, seven periods of time to create one planet. Then how many periods of time did he waste creating all of the planets that are uninhabited? Oh, he's wasting his time. <laughs> yeah. It's so sad. Oh man, it's very sad. Um, I, dude, this was this was very fun for me. I hope I know that people are gonna say uh, that we're just a bunch of snarky atheists, uh, and uh, I was a little snarky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if the shoe hey, fits, I guess. Dude, when you're like when you're attacking evolution because you want to prove that you know there's like talking snakes and talking donkeys. Like, if yeah. your whole worldview is to attack reality with your mythology, you deserve a little snark. Like, you should yeah. expect a little snark. Yeah, if, I mean, his argument about evolution was basically, like, saying that evolution is not created by God is like saying that cars that are being built by a machine are just being built by a machine. Nobody built this machine. It just came out of now. I'm sorry. That's a that's another analogy. It's a perfect example of Jacob can come up with some good analogies. In fact, I've been stuck in one of his analogies, yeah. and maybe we can um, maybe we can close on this. But um, when I spoke to sure. him, we talked about finding meaning. That was the point oh. of our conversation. Can you find meaning as um, as an atheist or as a theist? And what he did was he basically said, "Look, the world and life and reality itself." You are on the train to a concentration camp. That's what you're, that's where you are. And anything, if you are an atheist, everything ends. There's no point to anything. You're, you're not even comfortable on the way there for the ma vast majority of human life and life for that matter. It will be suffering. So it would be better if the train stopped, if everything came to a close, if everyone just died. You're on the train to Auschwitz. Enjoy. Tell me how you can find meaning on the train to Auschwitz. And uh, the truth is, sure. um, when those are the parameters, you're right. <laughs> when you're working within that tight of an analogy, then <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right, I guess. Um, I would like to see more parallels to how life really is that way. Like, I would like to see... But what I'm trying to say here is, sure, it's a very intuitive argument. You can You can make all of your points for this is not meaningful because... 
I say so essentially. But at the end of the day, you're living in an analogy. And anybody who has spent two days with somebody they love knows that uh, you're not on the train to Auschwitz. <laughs> you're just mm -hmm. not. Just like he can say yeah. you are, we can say you are not. And he can't say citations needed because when we say that to him, it all it all crumbles. Anyways, yeah. um, was that a part of your guys' conversation, the finding no. meaning, or did it not quite that, make it to that? Did not make it to that. But that's an excellent question. Um, coincidentally, just yesterday, I filmed a video on this topic with my yes. brother. Yes. My brother is an active, true-believing Mormon, and we Amazing. had a little dialectic. And we kind of attacked the issue of meaning from two perspectives. And I think I did a good job. Like my brother thought it was, he really liked my perspective on atheistic meaning. It was uh -huh. satisfying to him, even though he doesn't buy into it. Um, but first of all, before I rehash what I told him, um, I want to caveat what I'm about to say with the following. For some people, this life is a train to Auschwitz. There are some people who are suffering greatly, and mm -hmm. I don't want to diminish their suffering in the slightest. That suffering is sacred to a negative degree, such that yes. it would be sacred if we could remove that suffering. Because the yes. most sacredness is about what's important. And from an atheistic meaning standpoint, Suffering and happiness, those are the things that matter. Those are the things that are sacred, right? And I think that the theists are largely on the same page. All mm -hmm. of us, we all grant that suffering and happiness, that's where the meaning comes from. But the theist, they just shift the game to the afterlife. They're like, oh, we don't care about suffering and happiness now. We care about happiness and suffering later. Yep. And I don't think that's a healthy perspective. Because you're abandoning the now, which is real, and you're focusing on the later, which is not real. Right. And so you're not optimizing that which is sacred, which is how right. do we make this world happy and good for everyone. And so heaven, the idea of heaven gives people meaning because it's like all of these people that are happy and no suffering. Well, guess what? The atheist can do the same thing in reality. All you have to do is say this earth and I get pleasure from knowing that other people, we're going to eradicate poverty. We're going to ensure that the future is better. And so I can get pleasure from future generations of well-being. If I mm -hmm. can contribute to heaven on earth, I am building towards that heaven that is actually real. Yeah, I, I've said it before, but heaven is a place that's perfect at getting better. Mm. That is heaven. So you, there's no reason that can't be here. If you can make your life, I've said this so many times, if you could make your life 1% better every day, then on day two, you're working with 101% and you have compound interest working in your favor. And you end up making your life, I've done the math before, I don't know where it is, it's like 1,800% better in one year. It's a lot, it's not 365% better because you have compound growth. So um, that, yeah, I'm I'm excited for your video, man. That's very exciting. Um, I will be watching it. Uh, yeah, meaning as a, I don't know why it's such a a hang up for so many theists. It's like I, no, I can I find meaning in the fact that life ends, and so I have to make the most of it. I actually find that the scarcity. Yeah. If you had unlimited time, then the value of time goes down. That's simple economics. So if I have less time, then the value of my time increases it it to me it seems very very like cut and dry it's almost capitalistic <laughs> but, but it's almost as simple as like if i only have seven melons that i have to sell them for more than if i only had 12 melons but what do i know i'm just an idiot so um oh man this has been fun i'm out of words uh is there anything that you want to say to close up and then uh we'll i'll hit end yeah, I just want to say thank you to Jacob. It was fun debate. Thank you to you, Cody. Brilliant discussion, brilliant insights. And, you know, we are part of this everlasting dialectic, and we're, we're all trying to get closer to truth, closer to goodness, and each conversation is one step in the right direction. So keep, let's keep it up. Beautiful. Goodbye, everybody.